around later. That'd be lovely. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the, uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Trudy Deakin, founder and chief executive of Expert Health. Uh, Trudy, welcome to the platform. She's just getting mic'd up. Thank you. Can you hear me? I was just getting mic'd up then. For those people who don't know me, I am a dietitian by background. I started working in the NHS in 1993. I left the NHS in nine, uh, sorry, 2008 and set up the charity Expert Health. Today, I hope to challenge your thinking around how you work and whether you want to do things differently. There's bullet points on my slides. I'm not going to read out the bullet points. Those are for you to take away if you download the presentation. Um, I'm just going to give out the main messages. We all know that prevalence of, diet, uh, prevalence of obesity is increasing. And with that is the risk of diabetes. The costs are huge, and they're increasing too. Three in ten children aged between 2 and 15 are now overweight or obese. The obesity statistics for women has increased from 16% to 26%, and that for men from 13% to 24%. Sit down to physical activity? Well, we're certainly not meeting the guidelines. People are not meeting the 30 minutes times, five times a week, never mind the 60 minutes a day. And it's costing the NHS lots of money. Our sedentary time is also increasing. Six hours a day sedentary time and more at weekends and a lot of time viewing the TV. So we're basically couch potatoes. I don't know if anyone saw the Secret Eaters program. Did anyone see the Secret Eaters program? I thought it was fantastic because we know that the nation were not consuming the right diet. We're not consuming a healthy diet. And yet, when we report what we're eating, it looks like our energy intakes have decreased over the years. And yet, the Secret Eaters program told me that we don't always knowledge to ourselves what we actually are eating. So how does this impact on health outcomes? Well, we know that obesity increases hypertension. We know that it increases hospital admissions. We know that increased deaths. And we know that it increases long-term conditions such as diabetes, certain cancers, and cardiovascular disease. But, and this is where the challenge comes in, is the definition for obesity correct? And where does it come from? Well, we go right back to the 19th century, and a Belgian mathematician decided that he wanted to discover what a normal man was. So he researched and measured several hundred country workers, and he found and it was really interesting, he didn't do it for obesity reasons, but he found that if somebody was 10% taller, then it didn't mean that they weighed 10% more. The proportion was the height squared, and so that's where the BMI came from. So it actually, the person weighed 21 times more if they were 10 times, uh, if they were 10% uh, higher, taller, they actually weighed 21% more. So that was a really interesting notion, but nobody really took any notice of it back in the 19th century. 
But then in the early 20th century, people started to realize, and this was um, research done by one of the main um, American um, medical insurance companies, and they discovered that if people were obese, they died earlier, they died sooner. And Lewis Dubling actually devised some tables based on height and weight. And he devised tables and he got the normal distribution and then he cut the line down the middle and he said, that's ideal weight. So that's how BMI really started. Somebody from an insurance company looking at tables and identifying what they thought was desirable weight. Then in 1972, a researcher, Ansel Keys, confirmed the validity of the BMI. And so from this day onwards, then the BMI became a way to rank people as either healthy weight, overweight, or obese. There is, however, a lot of controversy around it, and you may have read some of the research papers, because the BMI, as we all know, looks at body weight and not body composition. Very recently, and this was a paper published this month, there's talk that are all obese people at the same risk of developing chronic illnesses as a result of their obesity? And it looks like that's not the case. It seems like some people who are obese are actually very metabolically healthy. So that begs the question, are we doing things right now? by saying to people, you're obese if you've got a body mass index over 30. Nice have one way of looking at it in their risk categories. You can see here that if somebody is obese but their waist circumference is normal, then they've only got slightly increased risk of morbidity and mortality. Whereas if they've also got an increased or a highly increased waist circumference, then they're at very high risk of developing mortality and morbidity. So that's an interesting point, and we could work from that. But at the moment, there's no criteria devised to actually identify whether somebody is a, a metabolically healthy obese person or whether they've got the metabolic syndrome. So, um, are we able to, Sarah, where's Sarah, are we able to vote via the app or do we have to show a uh, show of hands? Oh, where's she gone? Does anyone know? Can anyone tell me? Show of hands, right. Because I was informed before the conference that people would be able to vote on an app and we'd get the results up on the screen, which I thought was quite novel and quite good, but apparently we're doing it by show of hands. So. Just think now, what, from what I've said and what you've already known and researched yourselves, do you think that the definitions for overweight and obese based on the body mass index is the correct way of doing things? So hands up if you think yes. Ooh, I think we have a zero vote. And hands up if you say no. Right. So does anyone want to comment on that? Just one quick comment. Any research you've read or any research you've done yourself? Any comments from the audience? Yeah. Have we got a microphone? Anyone got a roaming mic? Right. I think refer to it because it's all we have. So you're suggesting that perhaps we're creatures of habit, yeah. and because we've always used it yeah. in our professional work, yeah. then we actually continue to use it because it's an easy assessment. Yeah, and a, so lot, of the, a lot of the research uses it, so, and which the research we refer to, so then yeah. we're trying to relate our practice to that research, and so yeah. then you end up having to use the BMI. Very, very good point. Mm. Do you feel that we should perhaps try and um, encourage our colleagues to start measuring waist circumference? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Because we try to get our educators to measure a waist circumference and enter it uh, so we can audit waist circumference, but I think we don't like to measure waist circumference on people. We feel like we're getting too close to people. Do you agree with that? Do you measure? Hands up if you measure waist circumference on your patients. So a few people, yeah. Um, recently I read a report that neck circumference as well could be coming in. Would you feel more comfortable measuring someone's neck? No? 
<laughs> but there's other ways of doing it. So try to think as well, you know, what other ways could I, rather than just relying on body mass index, are there other ways that I can assess somebody's risk through, uh, fat, you know, through the amount of fat they're storing on the body? Okay, so the next section is around diets and what are thoughts about the commercial diets that are out there. You may remember diet trials back in, when was it, 2006, something like that, was it, diet trials? I think it was. And that's when there's a research that uh, an RCT only lasted six months that compared Atkins, Slimming World, Weight Watchers and Rosemary Connolly, I think. It was four diets. And uh, you may remember the results. Um, there was around 5.9 kilograms of weight loss at six months. And there was no difference between the four diets, although initially there was more weight loss with the Atkins diet, but at six months, all the diets, they'd lost the same amount of weight. And so this was the conclusion, and I've copied word for word from the published paper. And it suggests really that us dietitians should be encouraging people to um, try a commercial diet package because we haven't got the time or resources in the NHS. That's the message the conclusion is giving, isn't it? So just start thinking yourselves, do I agree with that conclusion? And us as dietitians, can we compete with this? You know, should we say, yeah, 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 just go to Weight Watchers, go to Slimming World, you know. Um, we'll just concentrate on the real stuff, you know, the important stuff. But isn't obesity important? Apparently, 27 million people were on a diet at some point last year. And that's nearly half of our population. But we've just discovered obesity is increasing. So it doesn't really make sense, does it? Half the people in the last year tried a diet. But then, oh, obesity, is it the other half of people who aren't trying to diet that are increasing weight? I don't think so. People are spending money on it, so they tell us that they can't afford to buy fruit and veg. But yet, they'll buy a diet book. They'll, they'll, they'll spend money on that quick, fast solution that will give them 10 pounds of weight loss in a week. We're free. We don't cost money. So why? why it just doesn't make sense. So, is it because we're too cheap? You know, we know that people pay for quality, so if we're free through the NHS, or even if you've got a private practice, you know, what, what are your rates? Do you charge, are we too cheap? Or are we just simply ineffective? Do people, you know, not want to come to a dietitian because we don't get results? Or, commercial companies have a huge marketing budget, they really know how to sell themselves, so a dietitian is not too good at that. Questions? I don't know the answers. These are all questions for you to think of yourselves. And yet, if we were out there and we were being effective, rather than just focusing on weight, this, you might not be able to see it too closely, but the purple uh, in the bar chart, the purple section, is the deaths attributed to um, those dietary risk factors. And you look down at those dietary risk factors, we can impact and eat every one of those. So, as well as helping people to lose weight, we can also you know, reduce deaths from people not having enough um, fish and seafood, not having enough whole grains, not having enough nuts and seeds. We can impact on each one of those death rates there. We can save lives. We don't market that, do we? The diet trials only looked at outcomes at six months. And it looked like, yes, diets, commercial diets are an effective strategy. But then you look at the systematic review that followed up slightly longer term, and you find that actually there isn't an awful lot of evidence that diets are effective in the long term, apart from perhaps one trial of Weight Watchers where the results were followed up up to five years. So I'm now going to show you a clip that was on, um, did anyone watch uh, the Men That Made Us thing? I think it was in August. I'm showing you about a two-minute clip from part of that program. It was on BBC Two in August. To find out if the Weight Watchers model of gradual weight loss through careful eating and group support was any more effective than other kinds of diet. I took Weight Watchers' own statistics to the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, where Dr. Carl Hennigan, an expert in clinical trial data, analysed exactly what the figures mean. Carl, over the long term, for an average person, how effective is Weight Watchers? Okay, long term, over the long term, it's a bit general. What would you like? 
Five years. Five years, not effective. Full stop. Full stop. Carl, Weight Watchers do have a, a five-year study, but what does that show? What it shows is that two years is that actually, I've got the figure, about 20% of them maintain their goal weight. By five years, that goes down to 16%. So basically, you pick the best people, the lifelong members, and actually even they struggle with the majority of people not obtaining the long-term goal weight. Mm. And after 40 years of them, when are people going to wake up and say, this is not the answer? Weight Watchers was transformed from a small domestic business to a global super brand under the financial direction of Richard Samba. I wanted to know what he really thought of the product he had helped make so successful. When I came there in 1968, the turnover was $8 million. And when I retired in 1993, the turnover was over $300 million. Wow. How effective is being on Weight Watchers long term? It's hard. You have to follow the diet, you know, and there are, there are a lot of distractions. Just look at all the food in there. <laughs> you have to be motivated to get to, get to your goal weight. If you drop out, maybe something, something happens and you come along and you, want, you, you try again. You play the lottery ticket. If you don't win, you play it again and maybe you'll win the second time. Even using uh, Weight Watchers' own statistics, uh, the very best after five years, 16% of people have maintained their goal weight. I mean, that's hardly anyone. It's, it's, it's sort of a total failure. And I just wonder how on earth it is a business that can be so huge, can be based on patent failure. Well, but it's successful because the other... 84% have to come back and do it again. <laughs> that's, where, that's where your business comes from. I've got to take my hat off to you. You have a business where if it actually worked, the business would be over. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they said. Richard was the finance director of Weight Watchers for 25 years, and he said to me, if diets worked, we wouldn't have a business because the customer wouldn't come back. But because they fail, they keep coming back. Fantastic, eh? To so all those private practicing dietitians, you now have a fantastic business model for you. Okay, um, Tracy Mang is a health psychologist and she reviewed all the papers that looked at um, patients going on, on diets, set diets, and um, concluded that simply there was no evidence that diets worked at all. And she concluded that, you know, diets don't work because they're hard to do. People feel deprived, they feel hungry, so it's only a short-term solution. And there's no matter, you know, someone's willpower, there's no matter of time and, and they will lapse and, and their willpower will go. So. <sighs> When we're looking at papers to see, because if you look at, um, you know, this, we're, we're actually inundated with published papers nowadays, aren't we? And how many people here have taken critical uh, review, critical analysis skills training? So I'd say about a third of people. So important, isn't it? Because you can pick up one research paper and it will say X, Y, and Z is totally effective. And then you pick up another research paper and it will say X, Y, and Z isn't effective. So I think as dietitians, you know, if we were looking at the diet trials approach, we might end up recommending people to go on commercial diets as, as a kind of effective solution for their weight management. But then if you look at kind of better quality systematic reviews that look at the kind of do a quality assessment of the trial and also look at long-term data, then your approach might change. So I found the CASP really good uh, to provide free tools for people to actually develop their critical analysis skills. 
So the second vote that we're going to have now is that do you feel that the multi-billion pound diet industry has actually fueled the obesity pandemic? Do you think that people going on diets, we know this picture here I think is fantastic, you can see it, you know, before, after, <laughs> after, after. You know, it's that vicious cycle, isn't it? So hands up if you feel that uh, the, question, the answer to this question is yes. Okay, and hands up if you feel, if you think no. Okay, so we can have one comment from a yes and one comment from a no, if we've got a roaming mic. Anybody who wants to comment, a comment for yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> It's much more complex than that. It's not just about the diet industry. We had a talk this morning which showed all the factors that uh, influence uh, how our behavior changes. So there are many, many factors and you're talking only about one factor. So my answer would be no. There are other much more important factors that contribute to the obesity pandemic. Right, right. So there's one point of view there. Anybody else has a point of view for yes? I said no, and I, I agree with um, that right. comment. Um, I think there's lots of other factors. You can't just yeah. look at diet. Um, and the other thing is... Um, I totally agree. We can't point our finger at, at one exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone for yes? Yes. Okay, just one, for, for, in the essence of time, just one comment for yes. Okay, there's a lot of pressure saying I'm speaking for all the yeses, but I guess um, from my point of view, agree that yes, it's multifactorial, but when we look at the dieting cycle, it's that kind of um, all or nothing mentality, then it kind of skews their perception towards food past that first diet, and then, yeah, I think it might be that kind of binge cycling starting to develop. So I guess that's why I raised my hand for, yes, I think it fuels. Thank you, thank you for that. So we'll all come up with our own conclusion of what we think. And I think in my experience that in the 15 years as I worked as a dietitian in the NHS, I came across quite a lot of disordered eating and disordered eating that resulted from people trying on diets for several years. And so I think that's where my take stands, stands with it. But I think as other people have said, it's not one thing for all, it's very multifactorial. Oh. So, I'm now going to introduce the next clip. Um, if, if we feel that diets are not the solution or long-term solution for weight management, what is? Now, in the expert diabetes program that's developed, we get people to analyze their own diet and then set their goals of what they would like to do. And so it's not being on a diet, it's people looking at what they're currently eating and setting smart goals. And uh, I'm just giving a very small, very brief uh, video clip of how this is used, the dietary self-assessment. Hi, Deborah. You just attended the week two of the expert program. Have you managed to assess your own diet? And if so, have you made any or set yourselves any goals looking at your diet? I have true that uh, I've plotted here a typical day's, uh, what I've had to eat on a typical day. So I've had my breakfast had a fruit smoothie uh, with porridge and skimmed milk. Um, and then I didn't have anything mid-morning. For lunch, I had a, an egg mayonnaise sandwich. Um, with bread and mayonnaise. Uh, and mid-afternoon I had a banana. I didn't have anything then until tea time. Uh, for my tea I had a cheese pie. So with the cheese and the pastry, uh, pastry as well. Um, and also I had mushy peas with that and round about 20 chips. So I had three portions of chips. Um, then after my tea later in the evening, I had uh, a glass, large glass of red wine, and um, and so when I've plotted that on the board, um, I've looked and I've, I'm having five uh, portions of fruits and vegetables, eleven portions of carbohydrates, five portions of milk and dairy, eleven and a half portions of fats and sugars. 
and half a portion of protein. So what I thought from that true day is that I wanted to reduce um, my carbohydrates um, against my activity. I'm not very active. Um, so I wanted to reduce my carbohydrates uh, and also reduce my fats and sugars. Um, I've made a change. I've decided that I'm going to make the change and uh, not have pie anymore. So I'm going to, instead of having a cheese pie, I'll take out the, the cheese and the pastry um, and the chips. I'm going to have uh, a portion of lean meat or a portion of fish. Um, so that will improve my uh, proteins as well. Uh, and then hopefully, just by making that small change, uh, it should have a, a good effect on my uh, on my healthy eating diet. Excellent. And by reducing your chips and also by reducing your pastry, that's also going to re reduce your fats and sugars a lot as well. Right, right. That's good. That's good. So how do you feel about making that change? Do you think on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you that you can make that change? Because it's only a small change, uh, and I'm still going to be able to have my treats. Uh, I think that I'm, I am quite confident that I'll be able to do it. I'm quite confident. So it's good to, good to cut it off there. Um, so in their um, handbooks, they have the tools to be able to assess their own diet and then set goals. And if you want one of these handbooks to see how it's done, if you want to complete the slip that you should find on the chair that you're sitting on, and then give, come up at the end and give me a slip with your contact details on so we can contact you, I'll give you, I've got 100 booklets here, and I'm not going home with any. <laughs> um, so this is an example of the, um, one of the activity sheets in the book. They can uh, complete, so this is what she completed um, for her uh, dietary self-assessment. And then she set herself a goal, so she looked at what she was currently having, and she ring that she wasn't happy on the fact that she was having 11 portions of carbohydrate a day because she acknowledged that she wasn't very active. And she appreciated that because she was having pastry and chips, it also increased her fats uh, intake as well so she was able to um, make a small change which significantly improved her um, diet, uh, diet and also gave her a 500 calorie um, um, energy deficit as well and, and so, people, so people know uh, what a portion is then there's also the materials in the book as well to identify what portions are and there's been a lot of talk today around goal setting and, uh, and not prescribing to people what to do. And I see it very much as a collaborative approach, working together and listening, active listening with the individual as well. I just love this picture. Um, and so we use um, Bob Anderson and, and Martha Fennell's five-step empowerment approach. And what that is, is that we get people to identify what's my biggest concern about my health right now and our behavior isn't the problem I see it as an iceberg our behavior is that tip that shows on top of the water underneath the water is our feelings our values our beliefs and that is what um, predicts behavior so need, people need to address that element before they can successfully goal set and take responsibility for their health Step three is kind of, okay, I've identified my concern, I understand it now, but what could I do about it? If people try to do everything, then they just can't succeed. It's not a smart goal. So step four is, when I leave this clinic today, or when I leave this education session today, what am I going to try out over the following week? And how will I know if it's worked for me? So it's getting people to stop and think, because we're creatures of habit. I'm thinking, well, in everything I do, there's good choices and bad choices. And as long as I'm making an informed decision, then sometimes I'll make good choices and sometimes I'll be take, make bad choices. But at least I understand the consequences for my decision. So, next question. I know we've just got five minutes left, so I'm going to have to rush a little bit now. But do you feel, be honest now, do you feel that currently in your clinical practice that you actively listen to your patients and support them in setting their own goals hands up if it's a yes 
Brilliant. Great. Can all go home now? And hands up if it's a no. A few people there. Yeah. So something else to go away and think about. So finally, I think this is my last one, not the last slide, my last kind of part of the presentation, is around proving our worth. Because we had the brilliant presentation this morning around commissioning. And we got to the day, so someone asked a question around, you know, are clinical outcomes important? They absolutely are. And any way that we can collect our outcomes and document them is, is the way that we should all be working. We have an audit database, and so educators uh, have a username and password and enter data. And it produces automated reports. And I've just done one for Diabetes UK Abstract, which I'll share with you now. And this is showing, do I have a pointer here? No, there we are. This is showing that um, there's 38,299 patients on the audit database currently. So, you know, I think it's quite robust data. Um, evaluation score is 95%. Attendance score, it's an expert program of people who don't know, it's over six weeks, six consecutive sessions. 96% are attending one session and 82% are attending uh, four or more sessions. And empowerment has gone up by 23%. When you look at clinical outcomes, uh, I've only got confidence interval ones for the ones I'm actually presenting at Diabetes UK. Um, but you can see here that HbA1c at one year has, has dropped by 6 millimole per mole, and that's good, strong uh, confidence intervals there. Weight has dropped by 3.8 kilograms. Um, blood pressure drops in blood pressure. Uh, waist circumference has dropped by 2.7 centimeters, and there's pr improvements along the whole lipid profile. So, so that hopefully is going to please commissioners because we can demonstrate that we're being effective and I do absolutely believe it's the way we all have to work. So the last question for everybody, do you currently audit your clinical outcomes to prove your worth? Hands up if it's a yes. Brilliant. Hands up if it's a no. So there's a lot of don't knows there then. <laughs> Something else to think about. I don't think I've got a chance for a question for each. Um, have I got a chance for a question? Or? Right. So somebody, does anyone want to comment on a yes and somebody wants to comment on a no? Or we can just take general questions at the very end, if not. Okay, so the last slide, I think, is challenging you to think of what's the one thing when you leave the conference today, when you go back to your clinical environment, that you can do to improve your outcomes and demonstrate effectiveness. So just think and write it down, because don't we all know that if we write it down, we're more committed to doing it? And with that in mind, thank you very much for your attention. And I think I might take one question. Got any questions for Trudy? Stun them all into silence. <laughs> oh, one. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, um, just c coupling on from your outcomes, one of the biggest challenges we have is blood work. I'm just wondering how you get access to patients um, pre and post, and I guess I'm sure I'm speaking for the majority, very um, time limited, and I feel that I'm always chasing GPs. Um, getting onto a database would be amazing, but it's not practical. Do you have any hot tips for how one could get, um, get this information quickly? We, we found in areas where the GPs are involved in delivery, especially if practice nurses are involved in delivery, it's a lot, lot easier. We know it's difficult. We know that, that rather than reporting on 38,000 patients, we know that we should be reporting on nearer 200,000 patients. So there's a lot of data that isn't being collected, and that's because educators do report that it's a trouble to get it. If they've got access to something like System 1, it makes it a lot easier, but that's just for the blood work, so they still can't get the waste and things like that always. One more question? Okay. It's actually not a question. It's a... a, a a comment really. Um, I uh, work in Scotland so we are obviously not on the commissioning side that you guys are all on. makes a huge difference. Um, and we have something that's called a clinical portal. And the clinical portal enables everyone to put all their information in together so that we can look at all the different blood results, you can look at all the different letters and you can look at all the different information. Fantastic. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sounds brilliant. I must say, it, doesn't, it takes a long time to get these things put together, and we haven't worked out quite how to gather all that information together. So there's still a lot of work to do about auditing and collecting the information you need, rather than collecting the huge amount of information we collect and we don't use. So identifying the key outcomes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at Some a way where the results can be automated, but perhaps learning from Scotland will save a lot of time and effort. I think we try to be really ambitious with the way we collect information. And um, going back to one of your earlier questions, it was about do we audit or do we not audit? Most dietetic departments are looking at 50 or 60 different things that they do, and that's really hard to collect a lot of information for lots of different things meaningfully. So, if it was a bank, it'd be easy. It's money in, money out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult. Don't know. Mm. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Trudy. Thank okay. you very much for your comments so, and if you questions. Want to book, I'm here. <laughs> thank you.